diversity and inclusion, the board's role as agents of change. In this podcast, we shall explore the role of the board in helping organizations respond to become better at dealing with diversity, moving beyond the presence of diversity to being able to leverage, to use diversity to benefit the organization. Why now? The war for talent has become a top business issue, and in response, many business leaders are reviewing their overall business model and employee value proposition. Business need to look for talent in previously unanticipated places, and it often means trying to attract candidates from backgrounds that were previously considered as not traditional. Handling this challenge successfully requires strong leadership from both the executive team and the board. The board's role as custodians of the business brand, reputation and organizational culture is key to this process. The board has a real opportunity to be a powerful agent of change. I'm delighted to talk with Professor Randall Peterson, who is professor at London Business School and on the board of UN Women UK and leaders as change agents. An expert panel working through the Government Equality Office to facilitate positive change in the UK's largest employers. Welcome to the Better Boards podcast series. I'm Dr. Sabine Demkowski, founder and managing partner of Better Boards. We make the boards of the most ambitious organizations more effective. Our mission at Better Boards is to contribute to creating better boards. We do this by providing clients with an evidence-based approach for board evaluations and board development programs. We created an innovative digital platform clients can use for their internal and as part of their fully facilitated external board evaluation. To fulfill our mission, we give a voice to all who care about creating better boards. Randall, it's a great honor to have you and thank you so much for contributing to the Better Boards podcast series. My pleasure, really. It's great to see you again, Sabine. Lovely to see you again. It's a fantastic occasion to reconnect. You told me that you have built your insights for supporting boards to become more inclusive and diverse on three sources, really. Can you briefly describe them to our listeners and maybe explain how they fit together and why do these sources really matter to you? Yeah, thank you. So the first one was really some research I did for the Financial Reporting Council here in the UK. Now, what we're looking at is broadly applicable, and we've looked at other research and other data that's very consistent in other jurisdictions. But we looked at the idea that boards have become more diverse over the last 25 years. What difference does that make? Do they change? And we got to interview in depth over 100 directors and company secretaries about what's going on in their boardroom, how they interact with each other. We had multiple perspectives, so usually two or three per board. Make sure we weren't getting just one person's perspective. And I'm really yeah. excited. It's, it's rare to get those kind of data across a, a wide variety of organizations, you know, that are, you know, significant players. The second one was really writing my book. Um, I wrote this book about disaster in the boardroom, which documents 300 years boardroom mistakes. It's not just companies come and go. That's capitalism. It's companies that have made outrageously bad decisions. And were there any patterns in that? You know, we've got examples going back over 300 years. And we, we identified six different distinct trajectories through which boards fail, right? Really bad decisions. And then I've been involved with this Leaders as Change Agents, which is an expert panel on diversity. I worked with some of our MBAs and setting up this idea of instead of focusing on, you know, what would be different instead of focusing on what boards do wrong, right? You need unconscious bias training. If we instead said, okay, we understand some of that may be happening, but here's how to get it right, something different. And I think we really do see something different. And all three of these come together as a way of saying, look, we know something about what goes wrong. There's a parallel track over here about what to do and do it really well. And how does that impact the interaction in the boardroom over the last couple of decades? Fascinating. What are, from all of this, I mean, probably we could talk for hours, but what are for you the, really the most important messages for directors coming out of all this work and the research? 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I've spent the last couple of years really embedded in all this. And there are some, I think, really important messages for directors, company secretaries, no matter where you're working. That is that although diversity can benefit your business, there's no guarantee that it will unless you do the inclusion work, the engagement, you know, the really embracing it, which is hard to do. So just doing the kind of adding diverse voices to the mix is not enough. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's big ones. You have to actually do the rest of the work. And that's why then that whole, you know, it's diversity and inclusion these days, right? It's, you know, people are really focusing on that. And our data show that really strongly. The second one is really about diversity well-managed leads to tangible changes in culture. How we interact changes with a truly diverse board because we do the inclusion work, which means we have a more collaborative, inclusive way of working. And that actually has some very direct benefits to outcomes and performance for boards, not least of which we find in the one study that means fewer shareholder revolts, which ultimately, you know, over time means a company increases in value more. There is a direct line into performance, but it's not as direct as, you know, put diverse people in the room and it's going to somehow change everything. You really have to do the background work to it. You know, that much of the effort in this space is too focused on making boards feel bad. Here, let us hold your hand. Let's help you get this right. And we're all terrified to make a mistake. Oh my God, what if I say the wrong thing in a meeting? You know, will that director of color like come down on me? And so we we feel it as individual directors and we also feel it more collectively as a board. Oh my God, this is happening out there in the world. And it almost feels like a, a you know, if we get this wrong, it's somehow a threat to us. And in most cases, if you're making, if you make an honest mistake, there's forgiveness in there. And in fact, you know, if you focus instead on what can we do to get it right here, you're much more likely to actually get it right than the fear of what you're getting wrong. And then the last one, which I kind of knew, but is really confirmed is most directors get little to no support, training, education to being a director. And that's the role of a podcast series like this is to what are the issues? What are the things you should be thinking about? What matters here? And enough of it. Um, way too often, we just assume you've been in exactly the question what you're doing as a director, but do you? It's a very different role. And I wish we had better education for directors, not in a, as in a kind of you need education mode. You know, here's what people are talking about. Here's what best practice looks like. I want to encourage you to be the best director you can be. No, I can wholeheartedly confirm what you're saying there, Rano. I see this all the time. And I think you made a hugely important point. So much discussion about diversity. And yes, we have now the term diversity and inclusion. But in practice, I actually see few examples of good inclusion initiatives. Yeah, way too few. There are some out there, though. And there there are a hand, you know, there's a, a group of companies out there, a group of organizations that do this well. And if we we really seek it out, you can't just do it from a photo is the problem. Because just because the photo looks nice and looks diverse does not mean that again, you also have to have information on turnover. Because if you get diversity right, turnover remains low. If you get diversity wrong, you may continuously be appointing diverse directors, but they come and they go fairly quickly. It becomes a bit of a conveyor belt of people on and off. So it looks nice on a photo, doesn't look, and I wrote an HBR article on this, looks nice on the photo, but that isn't actually what we're talking about here. Sorry, it's now a nice detail, but what actually makes a good inclusion initiative? Maybe just two, three practical tips as we were just talking about it? Yeah, so this is part of what that work I did with our MBAs uh, started out, and they give a number of what I think are very good tips and the importance of work-life balance and actually talking about it. You know, everybody's going to have a different work-life balance that works for them, given their own circumstances. And everybody needs to work their 40 hours, of course, or their, you know, whatever their contract says. But outside of that, you know, are they willing to trade off weekend work or not? You know, maybe because of their family, they will or they won't. But the important thing is that we talk about it with our people. What is it? What kind of work-life balance is going to work for you and work for the company, you know, and work for us in this group. We don't talk about that nearly as much as we should. Basic issues of fairness and transparency are important, 
but maybe not for the reasons everybody, you know, sometimes thinks that they are. They're important because obviously people need to feel that sense of fairness, for example. But sometimes as, say, in our roles, we, we see something and say, well, it looks fair. The thing is, if other people think it isn't fair, whether it is or whether it isn't is kind of irrelevant. And with it, in the issues of fairness, it's all in perception, not in, in a hard reality. So that makes it tricky to get it right so that everybody or most everybody feels like it's truly kind of fair. So, you know, there's a couple of them that I think, you know, there's much more I could talk about. I think tangible kinds of things that we can also focus on that maybe people don't always focus on. There are others, of course, I think probably we know. Things like, you know, most professionals, you know, white collar workers want to grow their skills and they will work for an organization that grows their skills and even take a little bit less pay to do so. We've already talked about diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, equity is the fairness, inclusion, the really, Dilla's voice is really having the impact. Do they feel psychological safety to say what they really think? And does anybody respond to them in a meaningful way? So again, some of this we already know. Some of it I think is kind of more interesting and things we should be talking about, like work-life balance. Okay, I mean, you've done all this research and decades of research in, in these areas. Were there any findings that you found really surprising? Certainly really surprising in the moment. And now, of course, I'm, I got it, but at the time, they were really surprising. That is, first of all, that the business case for diversity, which is if you diversify, you need to get a better outcome, is actually wrong. I mean, it's not, and not only is it not correct, it actually does some damage. Because, you know, when you diversify and you, now you've got women in the workplace in senior position, you know, it's like, okay, show me the money. Putting a spotlight on people who are different in these scene, in these important roles actually brings out, when you get, like anytime you're in the spotlight, you're like, it feels a bit threatening. So it can actually diminish the performance of your newly diverse management team. So you need to rethink this. Stop saying that diversity is going to get you a better outcome and start saying something subtly different, which is diversity well-managed, right? Or uh, I like this one even better. To be world-class, you have to be diverse. Because what we find in terms of the research is that more diverse groups produce more diverse outcomes. The very best groups are highly diverse, and so are the worst ones. And it's all in height if you can manage the, this inclusion process. If you can, you're going to get a big in, in outcome, you know, a big positive outcome. If you can't, you're going to crash. So the thing that is true is if you want to be the best of the best, you have to be diverse. That is not even a discussion. So second thing that I found really surprising came out of this study for the FRC is that boards that are really good on one type of diversity are typically not great at the next. There were boards that were really good at gender but not very good at race and ethnicity and vice versa, for instance, let alone the intersectionality of, you know, of those things coming together. I mean, that one really surprised me because you would think that people who are good in one area of diversity have somehow nailed it because they know what to do or they can provide the right context or the right process, the structure. That's really surprising. Yeah. And the reason we now have a better understanding of this is, of course, the barriers to entry for different groups is different. So what helps you recruit and retain women, right, is not as what will help you recruit and retain, you know, an Afro-Caribbean director or a person of color on your board. We can get stuck and say, well, we've cracked the code. This is, we, this is, we've been successful with women. We just keep trying. And, you know, the, especially the women who first entered boards have tended to be high socioeconomic status. And those women just needed the opportunity, just needed the door open. Because once the door was open, they go to the same undergraduate universities. They know that everybody on the board and they know what the social rules are. So if you just open the door and let us in, we will show you, we can adapt and contribute. And they have, and they've done that really well. So I now just open the door, you know, to someone else, different ethnicity, and, the problem is, is that their social rules, my social rules are different. Things they say just don't seem to hit. And they're struggling to understand what's going on. 
you know, all of our shorthand cultural language doesn't work for them uh, or they struggle with it. And so we just don't connect. So best boards figure out that each type of diversity requires a little bit different journey to be successful in. Great insight. The next one was really about the directors we spoke to focus mostly on the diversity we don't see. You know, lived experience, neurodiversity, that kind of stuff, functional background. And of course, most of the population, the, you know, the stakeholders and the regulators are talking about demographic diversity. Really important point here, don't just use the word diversity, define it for people. What kind of diversity are you focused on? What do you mean when you say diversity? Because we can talk past each other really easily. Yeah, I think that's probably good. I mean, I, I might even repeat, though, this one about how little instruction, education, help there is for people taking on these really important roles as directors, you know, in business. Boards, people like us, me in education, you doing, you know, your better boards work, all need to get better at finding ways to help and support people be great directors. Fantastic. Brilliant insights. Now, our listeners always love really actionable items, you know, something they hear and something they can really put into practice. So how can the board and individual directors make a positive difference in helping their organizations to get better? We've talked about some of them already. We've talked about some things they can do already, like focus on work-life balance. But I think if I'm going to stand back a little bit and add a few extras here, one, I think people are oftentimes scared if they, uh, directors we find in our interviews are somewhat reluctant to talk about demographic diversity because they don't want to get it wrong. Uh, that's embarrassing, and B, they somehow worry that other people are going to somehow think lesser of them. And what we found is that most directors in our interviews care deeply about diversity, including the demographic ones. And we can be a little bit more brave in raising those issues in the conversation, in a nomination process, and so on. You might find that you have a lot more allies than you anticipated was one of the big findings we had from our work. And I think that's important, right? I'm going to encourage people to get out there and actually have these conversations. Again, you know, be positive. What can we do well? What can we do better? What the research shows really clearly is having a growth mindset, focusing on how we can get better, outperforms any other culture in terms of ways of working. So be that person who's trying to make the process, make everything work better, and take a few chances kind of along those lines. And then I guess the last one, you know, what could you tangibly do? And this comes from some research that is sometimes when if we care about diversity and we're looking for a very specific skill set, you know, it can be difficult to find somebody, you know, to find a diverse, a candidate who isn't a middle-aged white man with that kind of experience. And sometimes it's not, and there will always be those people on the boardroom as as there should be. But sometimes it can be easy just to say, no, there isn't such a person, rather than going back, not just to the big recruiters that we all know, we all know the names of, but search out, because they have their own problems in finding a a diverse Mm -hmm. board, search out some of the smaller search firms that kind of specialize in this area. And what you might find is, there's a whole pool of people out there who are not overcommitted, who are very qualified, who would make great directors. Oh, fantastic. Lots of pearls of wisdom in here. Now, what are the top three things for you our listeners shall take away from this podcast? Most important three things here for me are, number one, the importance of being willing and able to be an advocate for diversity What we find is that there are a lot more allies around the table than we typically anticipate in this space. And so if you take a little risk, you'll probably find more support than you expected around making your board more diverse. You know, number two, every single director has a role to play and can play a role in creating this culture, which is one of kind of learning and growth. How do we get better? Instead of focusing on what we do wrong, let's focus on what we can improve and you'll get a better outcome 
at the organizational level. So, and the third one was really when you're trying to identify a diverse set of directors, it can be really frustrating to find to find what you're looking for, to have that important skill set, you know, the right type of experiences and the right skill set. And it's hard work in order to, to do that. Fantastic, Randall. Thank you ever so much for contributing to the Better Boys podcast series. Well, you're welcome. It's a real pleasure to, to do this. How can we help you and your board? Do you want to learn more about the work we do at Better Boards? We at Better Boards are always delighted to hear from you. You can best reach us at info at better-boards.com. Thank you for listening.